we we are sad that Fred Richin, who is meant to be with us today, isn't with us right now. He has been unwell, and uh, his doctor didn't recommend flying. So um, Fred sent a presentation for us, which we'll be sending. But Fred is up. He's been up since 5 a.m. in New York, listening to us. He's out there on standby. At the end of it, uh, we will be having a short conversation with Skype. So if you have questions for Skype, uh, they will come through. Uh, I'll just let me very briefly tell you about, about Fred. Um, early in his career, Fred was a picture editor of the New York Times Magazine. He went on to write three books on the future of imaging. Uh, he created the first multimedia version of the New York Times, the first non-linear photo essay for the Times, Bosnia, the uncertain part to peace. Uh, with photographer Gilles Perez, which was nominated for a Pulitzer Prize, and most recently the Four Corners Project, which he will talk about today. Uh, Fred is Dean Emeritus at the International Center of Photography, where he began his teaching career 40 years ago. He's very sorry not to be here, uh, not to be here with us. So here's Fred's presentation. Hi, this is Fred Richin from New York. Be with you at least virtually, and to thank Shagadu and all the colleagues for the invitation. I'm talking about the post photographic challenge. It's the idea basically that photographs nowadays do not have the same credibility that they used to, and what do we do about it for social change? So, there was a time in 1968 when an image like this one was iconic, the earth seen from outer space. And the idea being that once we saw this worldwide, the Save the Earth movement started, it was on postage stamps, we still have Earth Day because of it, and right now, photographs don't do the same thing as they used to. In fact, the digital media that we're working with is conceptually much more quantum than Newtonian, it's not about cause and effect, it's much more about probabilities and possibilities, so you could compare a linear book to a nonlinear web or even computational photography in which something like two-thirds of the pixels are interpolated, guessed by the uh, algorithm as opposed to actually directly recorded when you're switching from a raw file to a TIFF or a JPEG. So this image of Pedro Mayer and his son on the left, Pedro Mayer and his father on the right, to me is an example of where we're at now. It's, it's the new family album in which you could be son and father in the same image. The idea being in a quantum universe, time moves differently, there's different possibilities, and my sense is very much that the digital imaging is not like conventional photography in fundamental ways. It does different things which we have to take advantage of for social change. So digital media itself is also code-based. It's not a, an accident that we invented digital media at the same time that we were reconceiving ourselves of DNA. We're code-based, digital media is code-based, uh, and it's much more about the genotype, about genetics, than the phenotype, about appearances, which is what conventional photography used to be like. So for example, these images of these two people are two people who do not exist, it's made by algorithms, by neural networks, by artificial intelligence. All these people similarly do not exist. And more and more, we're seeing artificial intelligence without a camera, no camera, being able to replicate and make lifelike what we used to think of as photography. So there's a website now, thispersondoesnotexist.com, and every time you refresh your browser, you see another image of another person who never existed. And this just came out about two weeks ago, but you can see what the confusion is going to become in terms of our sense of history, contemporary events, family albums, what existed, what did not exist. All these people I just showed you do not exist. You can go to the website yourself and just refresh and see all of this. So for example, this artificial intelligence video has former President Obama saying things that he never said. You could find it on, online, and it raises the issue of heads of government being synthesized to say things, to give speeches that they never gave. And how are we going to know the difference? 
Similarly, uh, with deep fakes, they're creating uh, easy to use software. So if you have enough images of somebody, for example, you could put them in a pornographic film that they never appeared in. So that Scarlett Johansson, a well-known American actress, says the internet's a vast wormhole of darkness that eats itself. She finds herself in many pornographic films that she's never been in, and she's basically powerless to do anything about it. So I want to show a few projects that instead of doing direct reportage, as conventional photography did, are using much more indirect approaches to try to move things forward in society. So for example, Chris Jordan in Midway Island in the Pacific is using work as an artist, very graphic, of the birds that are being fed plastic by their mothers and dying, you know, to give a much more indirect sense or a graphic sense of what's happening in terms of pollution, climate change, environmental degradation. Thomas von Hoytra's project, Blue Sky Days, which became the largest photo essay ever published in Harper's Magazine in the US, is showing from the point of view of drones in the United States, this is a wedding, uh, what we in the United States are doing to other countries by using drones, for, in, in our case, for not only surveillance, but with missiles. So he's trying to give people the sense of what does it feel like to be under surveillance, to, to put ourselves in the shoes of others, this is a funeral. Or this is another Blue Skies project uh, called Blue Skies. These are 1,078 uh, photographs of blue skies with polarized film over concentration camps from World War II. So Anton Kusters drove uh, something like, you know, uh, over six years photographing the blue skies over concentration camps, the feeling being we've seen many images of the grimness, of the horror, of the massacres, extermination, but maybe we can look more indirectly and have use our imagination as opposed to being told what's happening. So his point would be also that Syrian refugees in a boat are also seeing blue skies, that lots of things happen under blue skies, so it becomes more both very specific like on the map on the right, where you see all the camps, as well as very general, abstract, conceptual. So for example, this is by Celia Shapiro in the United States, where we have executions in prisons. So her idea was to get the menus of the last meals that different prisoners would eat before they're executed, as opposed to showing the face of the people, to show it this way so that we can imagine what it's like, and we also could imagine what class they come from. You know, you don't necessarily see wealthy people menus. You you see, uh, you know, people from poorer classes who are being executed. This is uh, from China, a project by Zhu Yang. The idea being that he had images, photographs of Tiananmen Square, which he published as negative, so that in fact you have to use your cell phone to reverse the image to be able to see it. So it becomes an art project as opposed to journalism, and therefore it's more palatable, it's more acceptable in certain societies to show things indirectly in this way. So a few thoughts in terms of how to work in this new environment in which the image itself is not automatically accepted as being true, authentic, um, factual. So one idea is to focus not only on symptoms, but to explore the systems underneath them, to look at what's underlying as opposed to just the symptoms. So when you're photographing war, it's not simply the, the casualties, the, the battle itself, but what causes the war? Why do we have a war? Is it economic inequalities? You know, what, what's going on? to be proactive as well as reactive. Can you make, put, have a photography of peace, not just of war, so that you photograph in advance of bad things happening so they don't happen, so that you try to understand it, to prevent it, you know, climate change being an example, to show what might happen so that hopefully we pass laws, we do things so the worst does not happen. Can we be transparent as to the code of ethics that we're using as image makers? You know, I don't uh, modify my image, I don't use Photoshop, I don't set up, so that the reader has an idea of how you're working. And also to engage the, re the viewer as an active reader. Don't always use photographs that just tell everything, 
but allow the reader to make up their own minds, to, to give them enough evidence to make up their minds, and to also work with the subject as somewhat of a collaborator in determining how do they want to be seen, not just how the outsider sees them. So a few more projects that get at this. The Autobiography of Miss Wish by Nina Berman has very much reportage-type photographs of a woman who's had a very painful, difficult existence in many ways. And the pictures are very strong and very graphic. But what she does differently than what other people do is that she's using these little markers in the book itself. And when it's augmented reality, so that when you put your cell phone over it, and scan it with, with the free software, you actually get a video that's attached to the book. It's, it's on your cell phone, not on the page, but you can then update the videos and show other sides to the woman. So for example, this is uh, one of the videos. Hey, hey, hey. She's getting that over there. She's going to the Okay. Don't worry, Daddy. Here, right? Does she got caught? She got caught. Yeah. So it hurt. She. Why are you keep hitting me? Oh, you give me five. Oh, I have five. So the point being that that in many pages on her book, Susan Mizellus used it in her work on the Kadrago on her book. People are beginning to use augmented reality. So so the page itself, which is uh, the photographs, also has the capability then to have video to have sound. One assignment I give to many of my students is now called the Interactive Portraits. So one of my students made this image, and then you turn the camera around, or you show them the, the, the photograph, the portrait, and you ask the subject, what do they think of it? So for example, this is this woman's response. You can see this image, uh, you can you continue, and 
you look at an image like this and you have to make up your own mind as a reader you have to be the active reader the thinking reader not just somebody who's told my sense is once a caption is created it's like a quantum collapse it's you know if you know quantum theory it's not the simultaneity of wave and particle but it, it becomes one or the other so in this case you see the caption it's twin brothers 16 years old one is five minutes older than the other who's deaf and one has hydrocephalus so what if, if you see the caption immediately you stop reading the image but this way you read the image you look at it and then you can do this online it's much more difficult to do on paper so a few metrics which i find very encouraging this project is nick nichols it's photographs uh, from gabon uh, in africa the country in africa and the president of Gabon happened to be in a hotel room where these pictures were on a laptop. He saw the images, the roads are difficult to, 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 to get around in Gabon, the road system is not developed, and he said, this is amazing, this is my country. And because of these images, the decision was made to start 13 new national parks in Gabon, and now 11% of the country is protected and a half a mile out into the ocean because of photographs like this in which the decision was made, these are so beautiful, let's protect it. Where then you have these images uh, from South Africa uh, in which the idea was by Western governments, NGOs, not to provide antiretrovirals for people HIV positive. The racist assumption was that they were not disciplined enough to take the medicines regularly. And Gideon Mendel, who's from South Africa, worked with a pilot program over four years and watched as, for example, this woman did take the medicine and got much better. And the work I checked with UNAIDS is credited with 8 million people being on treatment today, being alive today, because he was working proactively. Instead of waiting for the catastrophe, people to get very sick, the idea was if you work proactively ahead of time, then maybe a lot of people will be alive today who wouldn't normally be alive. <coughs> Access to Life and Magnum Project, similarly, uh, on, on the same idea with the antiretrovirals, is credited with raising $1 billion for antiretroviral drugs working with the Global Fund. They, the Foreign Minister of Japan went to the exhibition in Japan for 45 minutes, gave a speech in which he said they were originally going to give $200 million, and they doubled it to $400 million, because of the photographs, because of the exhibition, and they understood that it would be helpful. And here's another project from 2015, Clouds Over Cedra, which is a virtual reality project done by the United Nations. It was shown in Kuwait City, and the expectation was that the, they would raise $2.2 billion for refugees, but once seeing this VR piece, they in fact raised $3.8 billion dollars, 1.6 billion dollars more than they thought. So here it is. This is how it would look in 360. We walked for days crossing the desert to Jordan. A week we left, my kite got stuck in a tree in our yard. I wonder if it is still there. I want it back. My name is Sidra. I am 12 years old. I am in the fifth grade. I am from Syria in the Dara province in Helsinki. I have lived here in the Zaatari camp in Jordan for the last year and a half. I have a big family, three brothers, one is a baby, he cries a lot. I asked my father if I cried when I was a baby, and he says, I did not. I think I was a stronger baby than my brother. So this... This last project raised $3.8 billion. These are some metrics, and I just want to end uh, this section by just saying I worked on a project after the genocide in Rwanda. Uh, David Duranik ran workshops for children living in an orphanage uh, in Rwanda who lost 
their parents during the genocide um, there, and they made some of these most extraordinary images. This is by uh, Jacqueline, an eight-year-old girl, the, a disposable camera, the first roll of film that she ever used. Uh, this is by Musa. Um, this is also by Musa. And the interesting thing was that the work was shown at the United Nations uh, when there was a 10th anniversary commemoration of the 1994 genocide in Rwanda. They used the children's pictures because they felt the children's pictures had a certain optimism to them. They weren't just the victimization, depressed, like many outside photographers showed. And these guys uh, I recently met, they're now 26, 27 years old, they were the children in the workshop, and they decided to play it forward, to pay it forward, to travel the world, Ethiopia, the US, different countries, and work with young children who were like they were, who suffered from wars or drug addiction or problems, and do workshops with them. So here they are. Hi, I'm Gadi. Hi, I'm Bizimana. Hi, I'm Musa. When we were children, we were known as camera kids. Cameras and photography change our lives. And we know how it can change other kids' lives too. We want to share our story with you about growing up in Rwanda and our dream of giving back to the world today. So these guys just did a Kickstarter campaign and raised $36,000, which will now fund them to travel the world to many different countries to run their own workshops for children who are in difficult circumstances like they were. Okay, so I'm ending with this um, project, which I first proposed in 2004, at the World Press Photo in Amsterdam. The idea being that it's a way to increase authorship and credibility in visual media. Each corner of the image um, under, has certain kinds of information in it, in authorship, backstory related imagery and links, which allows the reader to access them and to find out more about the photograph when it's online. So for example, this very famous image, the four corners, then you're able to see on the bottom right the credit of the photographer and the caption. You're able to find out the code of ethics of the photographer. In this case, it's the Associated Press Code of Ethics, so you know immediately on all images that use four corners, what is the ethical code? I'm a fashion photographer, I don't work with underweight <laughs> models, we're too thin. You know, whatever your code of ethics would be, you can put it right on every image that uses four corners. The backstory on the bottom left corner tells you what was going on behind the scenes. In this case, the photographer feels very guilty, Eddie Adams, that he ruined the life of the guy doing the shooting. He thought in many, many ways that he was correct uh, to, to, to execute the Viet Cong because of what he had just did. In fact, his uh, neighbor and family were just killed. And so this was to him a retaliation. So Eddie Adams you know, felt that there was some justification for what he was doing. On the upper left is the related imagery. So for example, you're able to see the image before and after uh, what happened. So the hundredth of a second or fractional second of the photograph, you're able to expand upon. And now I'm going to show you the video of it, which is very difficult, it's very violent. So if you don't want to look, please look away. But you're able to now show the video. Exekution auf offener Straße. Mord vor laufender Kamera. So, and on the upper right, you have the links, uh, which would be to Wikipedia, to whatever you want. And for example, there's a, another guy who is working with the camera crew who explains what he saw. I don't think anybody can be excused for killing an unarmed man. However, it happens in wartime a lot. General Luan wasn't exceptional in that. He killed uh, the man, the Viet Cong, in the full view of the public in the streets of Saigon. That was exceptional for a national police chief to do that. So you're able then to put links to other ideas, background, history, and so on. 
So just a few very quick examples. We know this picture of Raphael and Curdy. Using the four corners, you're able to put in a caption, the credit. I wrote the code of ethics for the photographer, which is that while all photography is interpretive as a photojournalist, my photographs are meant to respect the visible facts of the situation I depict. I do not add or subtract elements to or from my photographs. You could write any code of ethics you want, but the reader immediately knows how you're working. Then you have the backstory. On the upper left, you have the image context related images. And you click, and you actually see Alan Curdy and his brother. So it's not just an image of a boy who's died, who's drowned, but you also have a sense of the family history, what's individual. The upper right, you have links, which also allows you, to, in this case, to link to the ethics of uh, you know, Human Rights Watch arguing why it's okay in this case to share a horrific photo of a drowned Syrian child when normally you do not share such pictures of children. So here's a code of ethics that you can choose from, and as I say, you could also write your own code of ethics. Uh, again, this is the U.S. invasion of Haiti in 1994. The idea was to bring democracy there, but in fact, if you use the four corners and you look to the side, you see what it looked like on the side, and in fact, it was not what people saw in the newspapers and magazines. With, I think it was something like 13 photographers photographing the event. And then a more fun one from soccer, the, the Griezmann of France scored a goal, and you're able to go through it, again, four corners, and then when you get to the video, you can actually see um, what happened, the goal that he scored. So you're able to give that kind of context to the image, as opposed to just keep a free-floating image. I remember when I was a curator on the history of Magnum photos, it was 40 years of Magnum, there were 400 photographs, and I realized that with 400 photographs, we were really only showing about four seconds of 40 years of history, which is not very much. The Four Corners allows much more to happen in terms of context. For this young man in the U.S., there was a campaign, if they gun me down, often when the police gun down people, Somehow images, like more gangster images, appear, but this allows the image context, so the related imagery, so you're able to see him graduating high school. So people cannot be stereotyped as just one thing. So this is how it works, the links, the authorship, backstory, related imagery, and I'm very happy to announce that fourcornersproject.org has just gone live this week. The, the, it's now available to use the uh, Four Corners software, it's uh, open source, nobody makes any money from it, it's just to be useful, and the way I see it is the first time in it, really since the caption, that we've gone further in terms of figuring out ways to contextualize the image, so we invite anybody here to use it, um, they're on it, You'll, there are instructions to see how it works, it can be used on Squarespace, on WordPress, and on your websites, and I very much want to end by just thanking my collaborators on this project, uh, Curry Hoffman and Corey Tegeler, who worked uh, very hard to make this happen. So I thank you very much again for the invitation, and available, I'm available for any questions or thoughts. Thank you very much. Okay, we will take the questions now. Fred <coughs> very kindly has stayed with us. Are you better? I'm much better, thank you, but I miss being with you guys. Well, exactly. We have to make up for this. Okay. We will. Any questions from the audience? Thank you for the great presentation. We loved it. And okay. here we go. My name is Rahab Alana. I work for um, an archive in New Delhi. Uh, and I work as partially a, a publisher and a curator. Uh, I was interested, quite generally, uh, in, in the sort of extraordinary way in which you brought about the question of digital universalism and how it has engaged with particular histories, with, with local histories. Uh, and how exactly have you gone about, and what are the ways in which you've gone about perhaps introducing this idea in curricula uh, over time? Uh, that's question number one. Um, the second part of the question is also looking at the Blue Skies project in particular. Um, I was intrigued by the way in which um, you thought about uh, looking at those images, poetic media, having a, a political resonance. 
And so, what is the place, what are some of the ideological underpinnings, perhaps, of bringing about poetic media into political space, if you could talk to that as well? These are the two questions. Thank you. Okay, I, I, I heard the second question, but not the first. Uh, shall I, okay. Shall I, I'll repeat yeah, it? repeat the first, please. Okay, so, the first. so the question of uh, digital culture uh, and universalism leading to uh, the unpacking of local histories, the unpacking of local situations. What are some of the ways in which curricula has brought about this change, or what are some of the ways in which you have uh, thought about it entering curricula in order to inform students? And I'm speaking, in a way, in the context of the previous discussion we've just had uh, before you, which has been about the relevance of teaching in photography. No, I mean, the, there are many, many ways to answer your, your, your questions. Um, one of the issues to me is that there are several trillion images in social media right now that we don't know about. We don't, um, we don't investigate their meaning. So one of the assignments I almost always give is what I call metaphotography, where you curate your own social media from wherever you come from so that the students then introduce their own culture to the rest of us by finding social media images that we would never know about um, in, 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 in classrooms. So, for example, there was a, a, I had a student from China and he found an image of middle-aged people holding hands in the middle of the street. And we asked him, why is this image important? And he said, because their children are taking the exam to get into university in the building next door, and they're trying to stop traffic so there'll be complete silence in the streets so the students can concentrate better, their children. Like, I never knew about things like that. So one of the big issues for me is that we're wasting an enormous amount of social media we're not investigating, we're not looking, and the people who really need to interpret it are the people who come from that culture because the rest of us don't know the culture, we don't know what it's about. And so I'm actually surprised that we don't have networks of students in universities and high schools who are, even on a weekly or monthly basis, showing us what's going on in their culture through social media. So when I travel, I often try to figure out where I'm going through imagery, and I end up with tourist sites. I don't end up with these very rich, textured archives of images from different cultures selected by the people from those um, particular places. And in terms of the, um, the politics of it all, I find that photography is often very passive. It's like you wait for something to happen and you photograph it, and then you show it, but you don't really uh, unpack it, you don't examine it, you don't pull it apart, you don't analyze it. And to me, the idea that you could use a double image, you could show you know, what the politician wants it to look like, but then you show how it's set up, how it's actually a, a manipulation in a second image. You contextualize it, you push it in different ways. To me, I've been asking for probably about 20 years that we start using two images, double images, to say this is what it looks like, but this is what it really is. I remember what motivated me in part was there was a press conference between uh, the U.S., Israelis, Palestinians, Jordanians, Egyptians about peace talks in the desert. And, you know, you saw the photograph, but then you read that they spent half a million dollars to air condition it outside so nobody is sweating, so it looks like they're making progress. And I asked myself, why didn't the photographer show the air conditioning units? You know, show the manipulation, you know, and try to unpack it and try to show us what's going on. And you could say that about almost anything at this point. So I think photographers see themselves often as, as just photographing what is. But what is is much deeper than appearance. And I think we're not doing a good job at going underneath appearance and saying what really is going on, what are the systems. You know, if you go back and photograph a history, they're fantastic, you know, let's say war photographers, but somebody like a Philip Jones Griffith's Vietnam Inc., which to me is a very important book, is not only showing the symptoms, 
but he's showing the system, showing what's underneath it all. And that's what I was trying to get at in this talk, is that I think that the mainstream photography is less and less important, unfortunately, but then it's up to us to find alternative methods which may be deeper and more complex and getting at what's going on. We're, we're thoughtful people, we're intelligent people, and we're much more than, than simply recording what is. We, we also have to ask what's underneath what is and try to show that to the viewer with the hope of making changes. So that's why, why the alternative interests me so much and also why the digital, you know, we often think of it as web pages and we think of it as stuff we already know uh, digital photography, I don't really think is the same as photography. I think it's something different. That's why I call this talk post-photographic. Because it's not working off credibility. It's not working off the immediate belief in the image like it might have been in the 20th century. It's working off something else. So I think we have an enormous palette. We have enormous possibilities that we have to use. Um, you know, and that's, that's really what I teach, what I think about, what I write about is how do you do it differently? How do you show it differently to have an impact? So I hope I answered your questions. Hi, Fred. My name is Alicia, and um, I run a project called the Kashmir uh, Photo Collective, which is a digital archive of photographs from the Kashmir Valley. And um, I really connected with what you talked about because of the way in which the media environment uh, in India has been transforming towards um, this, uh, particularly in, in television, towards the use of images without any backstory and even so-called credible news agencies often uh, using uh, very random sources of imagery in order to represent quite uh, important uh, events that uh, most recently, for example, could have led to quite a serious uh, conflict between India and Pakistan. And as someone who's so, I've followed your work for some time and the various collaborations with photographers, but I was wondering in terms of a lot of the innovative strategies that you've come up with uh, to kind of battle this, um, yeah, to battle this uh, question of authorship, how is it that we insert these frameworks into the, into the actual media spaces the, the, the way in which the media is actually functioning within our societies. Because photographers, per se, have very little control over that. So the larger public, at least in a place like India, um, is watching, um, apart from television, the news that comes through WhatsApp, right? So have you seen uh, in other parts of the world or uh, in any of your other projects the way that something like Four Corners has actually got Im embedded within a larger media infrastructure. Well, in my experience in conventional media is that they often wait for alternative people to come up with ideas and then they adopt them. I've shown Four Corners, uh, you know, many, many, many times to many media outlets. Some of them have said things like, yes, we're willing to use one Four Corners image once a week, but we're able to try it, we're able you know, to, to, to start to investigate it. The you know, World Press has said that in the future, perhaps they'll be able to accept them for prizes. And my experience in, you know, I've been doing this for a long time, is that you often see the individual photographers, alternative publications start to use something, and then the mainstream says, that's a good idea. And then they adopt it. It's going to take a while. But my hope is that, you know, I think there's a greater awareness that mass media is not doing what it used to do. You know, I often say, from the U.S. perspective, for example, we've been in a war in Afghanistan. It's the longest war in American history, and there's not one iconic image from the entire war. It's not working. We don't know what's going on in the world. I mean, I use the opposite. You know, that with the internet and globalization, in many ways we know less about each other than ever before. So I think it's really up to us to build a model and then hope that people adopt them in different ways. Like, you know, if Google, for example, adopts four corners, and when you do a search of any subject, first the four corners image is appear first before other images, 
I think that would be a good thing because then they're favoring images that are contextualized versus just images. So we all know that often photographers and mainstream media provide images and they get recontextualized and decontextualized by mainstream media. They write the wrong captions, they run them the wrong way. And you know, to me that's very much like providing a raw material for somebody else to refine and do what they want. So the push for me is that everybody is an author. You know, everybody has to contextualize their own images. If people use four corners, one percent of the time, that's fine. It doesn't have to be used on every image. But there may be issues like, you know, what's going on in India, Pakistan, or whatever it would be, where you want four corners to contextualize because it's important. So it gives you another option, another tool. And everything I do is to make photographers authors, not just providers of images, but authors of their own work in whatever way they can. And it's a long struggle, and it's been going on for a very, very long time. Um, the picture essay used to be a big deal in magazines, eight pages, 12 pages. You don't see that anymore. You see it in photo books. There's supposedly about 3,000 photo books published every year which is great. And then sometimes mainstream media picks up what's in the photo book. But, you know, oh, I, I just, just end, I remember maybe 25 years ago uh, a panel I did in New York on the future of photojournalism, and somebody from Life magazine was saying all these great photo essays they published and won awards. And then I said, but every one of them the photographer did on their own, and then you just picked it up. You, you didn't assign any of them. They just did it. So I think that's been the way for a long time, that we have to do the work and then hope that we infiltrate main, mainstream media in the best possible way. So again, I hope that answers the question. Yeah. Hello Fred, my name is Karen. I'm, I really like the idea of contextualizing images. Um, but um, I was asking myself if now with the Four Corners project, which I think is very interesting, Maybe it just gives the idea that now with the image I have the context, but I only have the context the photographer as an author opens for me. There could be many different contexts and you know, it, the image could change its meaning and everything. And so maybe that we create by using the Four Corners project also the fiction that now the image is contextualized and we fix it somehow in one context that was given by the photographer himself or herself. Yeah, I think, I think all images can be read all kinds of different ways by individuals, by people from different cultures. I don't read images the same way as people in Bangladesh read images or people in France read images. We all read them different ways. So to me, the four corners is hidden corners, is hidden information. It's not obvious. If you're a reader, you don't have to look at them. It's your choice. But if you do want to look at them, then here's some ideas, here's some links, here's some new information, here's different ways of going with it. Often a caption contextualizes an image, often in a very bad way. I mean, somebody, you know, I've, I've seen books of captions with no image, and you don't need the image because the caption, you know, just reduces the image just to one idea. So I agree with you, it's much more ambiguous, it's much more exciting than that. And again, 99% of the time, I imagine people will not use the four corners, they'll do it different ways. But what I try to show in the, in the work of the nuclear nightmare is, is if you show an image with no caption, and then the reader has to put the cursor, the mouse, over the image to find the caption, that means the reader first has to read the image in an ambiguous way. You have to make up your own mind. <laughs> If you, many people read the caption before they look at the image. I prefer you read the image and then you look at the caption. And then you decide, because it does have many, many meanings, and the caption is only partial. It's only one meaning of the many meanings. To me, I think of this as in quantum physics, I think of it as a quantum collapse. You know, in, in quantum theory, you have the wave particle. You know, the energy is both wave and particle, but when you observe it, it becomes one or the other. And I think captions do that too, they collapse the image. So I think what I'm trying to do with Four Corners, like related imagery and so on, when you look at Aileen Curdy, the boy on the beach, who's dead, it's horrible, but it's generic. But then when you see him with the brother and, and, the, and the stuffed animal, 
It's amazing. It's, it's a whole different feeling. And it gives the photographer the idea of juxtaposing images. It's, it's very much what filmmakers do. Juxtapose montage, juxtaposing images. So it gives you more tools and more possibilities. But there is no one single meaning. There's always many, many meanings. I agree on that. Any more? Yes? Something? Uh, hello, my name is Valentina. I'm a publisher of photo books. Um, it's, uh, it's really funny that you use uh, quantum physics because I use it as well as a reference in my workshop uh, talking about the cat in the box and uh, uh, the idea that when the box is open uh, then by the, the looking at it uh, we actually make up uh, the meaning if it's alive or dead and I do the same with the pictures. Uh, so the difference between uh, the maker and the observer and uh, as many as uh, we are uh, they are interpretation of the same image. So my question is uh, related to authorship, uh, the idea of authorship uh, in uh, photojournalism. Um, because when you are a photographer, a photojournalist who has who have to um, uh, publish a, a, a photograph on, in, a, in a newspaper, and the newspaper is embedded uh, in a political stake, stake and um, most of the time, photo editors don't allow anymore to show uh, certain type of pictures, and that, that, that there is the manipulation behind it. Um, uh, violent, violent pictures are not shown anymore uh, because we cannot send them anymore anyway. Um, all in this whole context of manipulation of the, the, the message, uh, where is the authorship? Is the authorship of just a photographer, or it, or it becomes a collective authorship? It was hard to hear, so I'll, it, it, it just the, the room uh, echoes, but I'll try to answer. In terms of authorship, there, there's several ideas. One is, when, when I did the Four Corners idea, I, I put in a code of ethics. Because when I try to find a code of ethics in newspapers, I don't know where they are. I don't know if they're the same as each other. I don't know if Time Magazine Code of Ethics is the same as the London Times Code of Ethics or the newspaper where you are or, or whatever it would be. I have no idea. So I don't know what the photographer, what, what, what the Code of Ethics the photographer is using. So they're often 12 pages, 15 page Code of Ethics. So the idea here was just to do a very simple one or two sentence of ethics. The authorship of an image is also between the subject and the photographer and the reader and the camera. There's multiple authors of an image. It's a collaboration. And I showed the interactive portrait of the boy, uh, of my student's uh, grandmother who loves him. She was the author of the image too. The subject is the author of the image. It's a collaboration. That's why I don't like to use the word taking photographs. I use making photographs. It's a collaboration. It's not a takeover. It's, you know, and sometimes I'll show that to photographers who get very angry, and they say, but you're taking away my power if, if I'm going to ask the subject what they think. I said, I'm giving you more power, in my opinion, because then the subject is part of the making of their own image, in that sense. So to me, the, the authorship part is really the sense that of responsibility. We all have responsibility for the images that we make, for how they're used, as much as we can control it, we can't always control it. But again, I don't want us just to be handing pictures over to somebody else to decide how to use them, to decide what they mean. But I at least think it's important you know, that people make an initial gesture. This is what I think. Magnum, for example, when it began, the photo agency, you know, would say on the back of the image, you cannot crop the image, nor can you use the image in a different context. And they would say what the context is on the back. You know, frankly, for some people like that believed in authorship. I'm the author. And so I think it's a power struggle. I think it's really an important, you know, labor issue for photographers to have as much uh, control as possible. And I know it's not always the case. I know it's not often the case. But I think it's important uh, to strive towards, especially with the number of websites that are alternative, the ways you know you, people use it on their own websites. You know, it's possible to set a better example. 
So just like there's no one meaning, there's no one authorship. It's a collaboration, the making of an image. Um, you know, but but I think more and more of these things have to be conscious, and these things have to be expressed. But look, I think if we're having a revolution, a digital revolution, the revolution is not in hardware. It's not. It's not just in computers and cameras. The revolution has to be in thinking. It has to be political. It has to be a change. Otherwise, we're wasting the revolution. It's, it's not just doing the same thing with different equipment. It's trying to rethink it and do it differently. And so I think, you know, in that sense, the digital revolution is just at the very beginning now because the thinking process is still usually, let's do the same thing but more efficiently than before. I, I think that's a waste. I think we have to do something different and not the same thing that we did before. Otherwise, there's no revolution. It's just a revolution in manufacturing. It's not a revolution in thinking and politics or in the future of the globe. You know, if you have a problem with climate change, if you have a problem with many of these things, we have to come up with the imagery that's going to make a difference. You know, we can't just do what was done in the 20th century and expect it to work. It usually does not work. So what will work? And that's, that's really what we have to figure out. What's going to work? What's going to make it better? And when I showed the examples in this talk, you know, of, of 8 million people being alive because somebody made images proactively, or, you know, $3.8 billion being raised for Syrian refugees using virtual reality, that's a lot of people being helped. That's a lot of people whose lives are better. And I think these are examples uh, that we have to look at and ask, can we do things, you know, that, that are all, also are helpful? And what surprises me often is how few people know about these projects, you know, know about these successes. Um, we don't talk to each other. We're not aware of those things. We're a little bit too much in our own bubble, you know, in our own way of thinking, you know, which is, goes back to the Marshall McLuhan idea that we're all going 150 kilometers an hour looking through the rear view mirror. You know, we're just looking at the past. We're not looking in front of us. And so that's what I really try to do is think about what's in front of us and what are the new strategies, new ideas, you know, that we can do. Uh, how do we think of image differently? How can image be more important? You know, how can we make a bigger difference? We have to be creative, thoughtful, and try to figure this stuff out. Um, because, you know, the, 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 there's a lot, you know, we all know there's enormous challenges at this moment. And I think it's up to us to try to figure out new ways of using things, imagery in particular, that can be helpful in the world. $3.8 billion for Syrian refugees. You know, they're expecting to raise $2.2 billion. They raised $3.8 with virtual reality. Well, that's interesting. Will it work again? We don't know. We have to try it. There are different ways. But, but there's a lot, of, uh, a lot of possibilities at this point. Thank you for the, two, the, the word resistance and uh, revolution. It's really needed. Well, on that note, perhaps, I think we'll call it today. Thank you very much, Fred, for being with us, for staying up this day. Thank you very much. Okay, take care. Thank you very much.